Josh Dobbs in Tennessee visiting Florida. There's a great atmosphere down there in the swamp. I was there this morning. Fourth quarter, Tennessee 20 to 14. Jalen Hurd, Tennessee led 27-14. Four minutes left in the fourth quarter. Florida trailed by 13. Second and goal. Will Greer, Powell. They trailed 27-21. Under two minutes left, it was the same score. Fourth and 14. Fourth and 14, Joey. Yeah, no pressure on the quarterback. We already know Tennessee's secondary is suspect. Callaway breaks away. Get, it's this, If you get into their secondary of Tennessee, not great tackling back there. You can make big plays. Ask Oklahoma, and they did the same thing. Antonio Callaway game tied at 27, and then Aaron Medley. 28-27, Florida. Second chance after the timeout. Look at this rotation trying to get there. Medley's kick just inches away. Florida wins it. More than anything, I'm just, I feel so good for these guys because they really have invested in uh, this whole team. Now we get a chance to go test ourselves against a great opponent that Obviously, probably should come in here and beat the heck out of us. So, you know, it'll be fun. Here's the best thing is is seeing their faces in that locker room after a win like that. Man, that 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 that's what warms your heart. Man, it has been a tough road for Tennessee against Florida. 11 straight loss to the Gators. Blew a fourth quarter lead for the second straight season for the third time overall during that stretch. They just cannot get through against Florida. So it was deja vu in the Arkansas-Texas A&M game on Saturday. And unfortunately, if you're a Razorbacks fan, that means back-to-back -back losses to the Aggies. Texas A&M overcame an eight-point deficit in the fourth quarter to force overtime. Quarterback Kyle Allen threw for 358 yards and two touchdowns. And freshman wide receiver Christian Kirk, he had 173 yards receiving. Now, Arkansas needs to improve their pass defense by Saturday. The Hogs are the only team in the conference to allow over 1,000 passing yards this season. They rank last in total QBR allowed, completion percentage, and 20-yard completions. Brett Bielema is seeing some improvement in his team, but says they just haven't put it all together yet. Saw a lot of things, obviously, that uh, were positive. Uh, but we did enough things, obviously, to lose the football game. I think two things jumped out offensively, uh, kind of maintained our, and, and continued to build our identity that I think we'll have to have to win, um, win in the SEC as far as being able to run the football, have had some efficiency. Um, one of the things that uh, we concentrated on the flip side of it defensively was third down, and uh, uh, I believe we went two for nine on third downs, or they went two for nine. Um, it could have easily been nine for nine. We lost, lost a little bit on a quarterback scramble twice, but... Uh, again, reemphasize to our coaches and our players what we emphasize during the course of the week. The players will usually do, and we just got to keep uh, plugging away and continue to build on the things that uh, we need to do to have success. I've never been to Tennessee. Uh, I'm looking forward to this environment. Obviously, uh, um, a few of our guys uh, um, have, have uh, had recruiting ties and visits to Tennessee and stuff like this, but this is uncharted waters for most of most of our team, most of our staff. So, uh, crowd noise will continue to be effect. Obviously, uh, handled that at times on Saturday, but but others, you know, with the offsides penalties, we're going to make some corrections there. Um, they got a very talented offensive football team, a defensive football team that. Uh, uh, is a good team. I actually re recruited Kurt Majet, the kid that got injured. Uh, so I know they lost at least one good player and, and they have a lot of good players on defense. They're young, probably similar to us. Um, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity and the challenge to, to go over there. Butch is probably going through a lot of the same things we are. He's got a young football team and, and uh, um, you know, Florida really took advantage of some some uh, big play opportunities. They had some guys turn some uh, short yardage gains into long term, long term, or long um, long plays, extended plays that uh, uh, took advantage of of really just some guys making some plays. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't, I don't know their statistics or anything like that, like you said there, but uh, they're they're a, they're a team that's searching for that that identity like we are. Our kids aren't flinching an inch. I mean, they 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 came out Sunday with with great composure and attitude. I'm, I'm expecting today 
uh, tomorrow to have a great practice. Um, I really don't believe that they'll go anything but over to Tennessee and uh, expect to have success and play uh, a four-quarter game or an overtime game, whatever we need to do uh, to, to have success. And if we can get it, I, I just kind of – let's not wait till the last bye week to start playing well. You know, as my message was, hey, we came back. We could play with anybody at the end of the country the last three weeks. I'd, I'd like to have a few more wins and wait till, uh, wait till after our last bye week to get that done. Back here with Clint and Greg, and Brett Bielema just said that his team is still searching for its identity, and he saw some improvements. But what are the things, the takeaways that the Razorbacks can have that are maybe on the positive side well, after that loss? Well, there's three things that, that I really appreciated from their game plan against the Aggies. One, they controlled the ball for almost 40 minutes in the game, just under 39 minutes. They also averaged over five and a half yards a carry. And I know AM's defense, not exactly the most stingy in the country, but that is at least a step in the right direction. And it was the second consecutive game with 40 plus rushes. So they do have that identity. They need to stick with that identity because they have receivers out on the outside that aren't necessarily capable of making plays. Yeah, they definitely got back to that overused word identity, right? Mm -hmm. that they, they, the first three games of the season, it didn't look like the same Razorback team that finished so strong last year. So that's the most important thing. All things considered though, Greg, you gotta realize this, this fullback, starting fullbacks hurt, the number one tailbacks hurt, the number one receiver's hurt. Now Alex Collins and, and, and uh, Henry are, are banged up. So this is this is a football team that's playing on its last leg and really fought till the end against a pretty good football team. Yeah, and despite that, Alex Collins still had 151 yards rushing. It seemed like they were getting back to what we know to be Arkansas. But when critical plays needed to be made, they were not made. So how does that something that you fix within a team? And sometimes a team just has to learn how to win. And they learned last year in emphatic form against LSU. They finally broke through, and we saw a different different team in the last month of the season. Now, will they find that out in the first week of October against Tennessee? Because that's going to be a tough matchup this weekend for Arkansas, especially coming off three consecutive losses. I, I believe this, Greg. I believe it starts with the quarterback. I mean, I, every quarterback in college football history, whether it's Arkansas, whatever school you're talking about, the ones you remember make plays in the fourth quarter. They make plays in big games. They make plays when the opportunity arises. And right now, obviously the team has it, but Brandon Allen has to step up and make plays when the game's on the line or when there's a time to go up by a two-score, a two-possession score, a lead. So those things are what has to happen for Arkansas. The good thing is the identity's back. Now they can get back to figuring out how they can make those plays to win games instead of, instead of soul-searching. You know what's interesting after the game quarterback Brandon Allen actually said I know I don't want to say this but we've been here before yep. I mean we've been one and three before this is nothing new could in some instances that possibly help this team that's been through issues like this before but yeah I guess if you're trying <laughs> to find the silver lining let's be honest this is a team that had aspirations of winning the SEC West those have gone by the wayside in their own doing mm -hmm. so I don't think you can sit there and say well we've been here before we know how to re rebound well sure that's fine but you had aspirations of doing much more. We talked about the quarterback. I, I do think that he is partially to blame, but the defense is a shade of its former self. We talked about more depth in the D-line. I haven't seen stars emerge. We talked about Brooks Ellis moving over to Martrell Spate's, Spate's spot at the weak, weak side linebacker spot. Sure. He's struggling. Secondary, not very good, not very athletic. So I have issues with this team right now, and I'm just not sure they have the star power on the defensive side to get there. I, I agree with you on the defensive side of the football, but this, this is a team with the personnel that they have. They have to play a lot of man-to-man -man defense, and with that is going to come the big plays, especially in this conference and against Christian Kirk and, and Kyle, Kyle Allen and those guys. They, they take shots more than anybody in the country. So that's going to happen. They're going to have to learn to live with those big plays. You can't let teams dominate the clock. You said Arkansas possessed it 40 minutes of the game. That's huge for them. They've got to continue that moving forward. Okay, so with all that being said, they have one conference loss. Alabama has a conference <laughs> loss. I mean, not throwing in the towel yet for the Razorbacks. Even though it doesn't look completely bright, still could be in the race for the SEC West. So did Arkansas and Tennessee, the way they finished up last year. We thought they'd carry that into 2015. It has not happened. Of those two teams, which one do you think has been more disappointing? Well, I'm in shock over Tennessee, and not the fact that they've lost a game or two. Uh, that could easily happen. But the way they have lost, I know the, na the nation has talked about Butch Jones, but for good reason. I really believe the Tennessee players have done enough to be undefeated right now. And had they beaten Oklahoma and had they beaten Florida, they would be a top-10 team. But Butch Jones has made inexplicable decisions, and he has cost that team mightily. But the team does have to execute, and they were in position to execute. 
I see all these things that have been talked about with Butch Jones and decisions that he made that people are saying, people that I respect are saying that were just terrible decisions in terms of game management. And I can see where you can make a point either way, like with that two-point conversion he did not go to with 10 minutes to go in the game, did not go four. He went for one instead. I see that as a 50-50 call, and it could have gone either way. And so I don't see this as being some sort of a coaching meltdown. I see this as still a young team that's a year away. I'm surprised, though, that neither one of you is taking Arkansas because of the way they've looked. I mean, Paul, you mentioned that Tennessee could have won those two games. So they didn't look terrible, one of them being on the road. Arkansas at times has looked absolutely awful this year. Well, they did look better against Texas A&M because Brett Bielma finally went back to Arkansas football. I mean, it was physical, and he was running the ball, and he nearly pulled that off. For all of us, though, Tennessee plays Arkansas this week, so the loser of that leaves town. Neyland Stadium on ESPN2 on Saturday night at 7 o'clock, so we're all going to obviously pay attention to that and see if the loser does have to leave town. Well, that kind of brings me back to my next question, Paul. Of these six teams that we talked about, who do you think has the best shot to turn it around and have a successful season, whatever that is, in their own minds? get it back together again this week and win against Arkansas, and I think they have a re- really good chance of doing that. Then they get Georgia the following week, Alabama a couple weeks later, so they have a real shot at turning this thing around. Uh, you mentioned it, Paul, a little while ago about the coaching situation at Tennessee. You touched on it, but I want to touch a little bit more on it. So far this year, teams are 188-3 and three when leading by 13 points or more in the fourth quarter. Two of those three losses are Tennessee. Now, to Trevor's point, is it that players aren't executing, or is it more the fact that Butch Jones is having a hard time finishing out games, and is this sort of an epidemic with him, or is it just a couple of bad moves? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's on him. And listen, I respect what what Trevor said, but he had a chance to go in for the kill against Oklahoma, and he tensed up. To me, it doesn't look like he knows how to win. And then Saturday in the swamp, it happened all over again, and that's the one that I don't understand. If you blow a game at home against Oklahoma, it seems like you would have learned something. Saturday, I didn't see anything that Butch Jones had learned, and I think the criticism uh, on him and toward him is justified. See, Paul, I completely disagree. And I think a lot of the criticism is centered on that decision to go for one instead of two when they scored with 10 minutes to go. That would put them up either, if they went for two, they'd either be up by 14 points or by 12. Instead of they kicked the field, or excuse me, they kicked the PAT. Now they're up by 13. So two field goals and two PATs could beat them. Well, that's what Florida did. They got two field goals, or excuse me, two touchdowns, two PATs. But it could have worked out completely differently. It could have been that Florida got a touchdown, got the ball quickly back, and got a field goal. And now well, at the end, they're driving to get a game winning field goal you're instead saying of a 10 touchdown. minutes was, well, there was too much time the, on the clock. Too with much time. Trevor, I don't think that would have happened, but, but it was really his answer. Uh, he said it was on the chart. And to me, uh, you, you played football. Ball, obviously, when you're that late in the game, go for two. You have absolutely nothing to lose. I, I think it was more his attitude that upset Tennessee fans and many in the media than what he did or didn't do. I mean, he just didn't own up to it. I, I thought he handled it miserably. But see, Paul, I don't, I, I don't think that he did anything that showed bad attitude. And to okay. own up to, I, I thought the decision was fine. It was 50-50. He could have gone for two, and that could have cost him the game. Well, he, he could people, have, but he ended up losing the game, and he also lost the game because of a defensive call on fourth and 14. I think you can at least agree with me on that one. Well, there was there were some calls out there that you make on the sideline because you see what's going on on the field and what you think your players can do. But yeah, that two-point conversion, though, I think it's unfair. Some clock okay. mismanagement as well towards the end of the game where his coaching staff wasn't sure whether the clock was stopped or not on first downs or out-of-bounds plays. A lot of question marks. And to Paul's point, some might be able to be answered at least with a win at home against Arkansas on Saturday night. It's going to be interesting to watch that one. Every year in Atlanta, the SEC honors past football greats from their 14 universities. They call them... Fittingly enough, legends. Uh, The class will be honored at the 2015 SEC Football Weekend of Champions, December 4th and 5th in Atlanta. That first class had George Rogers. Billy Cannon was part of the class of 96, and our own Matt Stinchcomb is in the class of 2009. The legends were officially announced on Tuesday, and they are... Alabama linebacker Woodrow Lowe is one of just two players in Alabama history to earn All-America honors three times. In 1973, he set a Crimson Tide season record with 135 tackles. That record still stands today. Arkansas running back Madre Hill was a first-team All-SEC selection in 1995. He rushed for 2,407 yards and 25 touchdowns in his career and holds single-game school records for rushing touchdowns and rushing attempts. 
Auburn linebacker Takeo Spikes led Auburn in tackles in his final two seasons on the Plains. He earned All-SEC honors twice and All-American honors in 1997. Florida running back Fred Taylor was named All-SEC his senior year in the swamp. He led Florida with 1,292 yards and a team-high 13 touchdowns in that 1997 season. Between the hedges, Georgia defensive tackle Richard Seymour led the Bulldogs with 74 tackles in 1999 and became one of only two defensive linemen to lead the team in tackles for a season. Seymour was a two-time All-SEC first-team selection and a first-team All-American in 2000. Kentucky defensive lineman Dave Roller earned All-American honors his senior season. He was named first team All-SEC in his final two years in the Bluegrass State and was inducted into Kentucky's inaugural Hall of Fame class. Down on the Bayou, LSU offensive guard Alan Fanica earned consensus first team All-America honors in 1997. He was the winner of the Jacobs Blocking Trophy given to the best blocker in the SEC that same year. Over in the Magnolia State, Ole Miss defensive back Kent Lucas earned All-America and All-SEC honors as a senior in 2000. He led the nation with an Ole Miss record 30 passes defended and led the Rebels with five interceptions. In Starkville, Mississippi State linebacker Mario Hagan was a first-team All-SEC selection in 2000. He led the Bulldogs each of his last three seasons and led the SEC in tackles with 132 as a sophomore. In the Show Me State, Missouri defensive back Roger Worley was a consensus All-American in 1968. He was later inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2003 and later inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2007. South Carolina cornerback Andre Goodman totaled 86 tackles with four interceptions and 20 passes broken up during his Gamecock career. He earned second team All-SEC honors by the league's coaches as a senior. On Rocky Top, Tennessee defensive end Chuck Smith was hailed as the best defensive end I ever coached by Tennessee coach Johnny Majors. Smith was a key part to the Vols' 1990 SEC and Sugar Bowl championship team and then went on to earn all SEC honors in 1991. Texas A&M running back Bubba Bean was named All-Southwest Conference twice during his time in College Station. He finished his career as the Aggies' all-time leading rusher with 2,846 yards. Vanderbilt wide receiver Earl Bennett became the SEC's all-time leading receiver with 236 catches in only three years in the Music City. In all three of those seasons, he earned all SEC honors, including All-American honors in 2005. If you make your way to the SEC title game December 5th in Atlanta, you will see all 14 legends honored before kickoff. Ooh, that fourth quarter was a roller coaster for Vols fans. Before the Gators cut the lead to six, Tennessee still had an 87% chance to win using ESPN's win probability model, and that number jumped to 96% on fourth and fourth team. But then Will Greer found Antonio Callaway for the score. Tennessee still had a chance, though, but Aaron Medley missed the 55-yarder at the end of regulation. Here's Butch Jones. Reviewing the video, I thought we played uh, – well enough to win the football game. Uh, we played well in all three phases, uh, offense, defense, special teams. Uh, comes down again to closing games out, as which we're all aware of, and we had many opportunities to do that. Uh, again, in order to improve and correct this, we must own it. It starts with me first and foremost, and it starts with everyone within our football organization of owning it. Uh, Really, really proud of our players. Uh, they're putting themselves in positions to win. We just have to perform at the critical moments, the critical junctures of the game. But with their effort, their style of play, uh, very, very proud of them. And we're going to continue to need that and more so as we continue uh, to move forward. You know, uh, I thought we did a great job of managing the game, of getting it down there and giving us an opportunity. There was some... Uh, Moments, I think, with communication problems from the officiating crew to the coaching staff in terms of clock stoppage. Uh, There's a number of times where we thought that the clock should have been stopped on first downs. 
Uh, so I think there was some of that going on. But again, we put ourselves in position uh, to where we had to to win the football game. It's a very difficult kick. We understand that. Uh, you know, Aaron does a great job. Uh, he's made those in practice and he'll make those in his career. But, you know, I think there were some things just from a communicative standpoint of, you know, stopping the clock. Is he out of bounds? Was he in bounds? Some things that way. Uh, nobody's going to feel sorry for us uh, playing a very, very talented Arkansas football team, very physical, very big. And they're basically in the same situation as we are. Uh, they've had some gut wrenching losses where they could have won the football game. And it's a play here. It's a play there. And they're going to come in here ready to play uh, just like we'll be ready to play. So it should be a heck of a football game on Saturday. But uh, they have our full attention. Uh, very, very talented, very physical, and it's going to take everything and more so. They present many problems defensively for you in terms of their style of play, their personnel, and then also what they do schematically defensively as well. Back here with Clint and Greg, and we saw Tennessee have a late collapse against Oklahoma. Greg, how do they let this happen again? By playing conservative. They did exactly what they did when they played against the Sooners. They got conservative defensively. They struggled moving the ball offensively. You see two inside runs when they're trying to ice the game. And then you rush Josh Dobbs out to the right side into the boundary. I really had an issue with their offensive play calling. And then defensively, you know what happened there. Yeah, I mean, they, they collapsed on both sides of the football. They allowed Florida to go up and down the field in the second in the second half, particularly in the fourth quarter, at will. And, and the, unfortunately for Tennessee, there was a good product on the field for three and a half quarters. Really, there was a good, there was a lot of good going on, but at the end of the day, it wasn't enough to win the football game. You mentioned all that good going on. We've talked about it, of course, what Josh Dobbs can do, what he can do with his legs. Then you've got Jalen Hurd, you've got Alvin Kamara. Where do they go from here with maybe some of the positives that were in that game? Well, they have athletic ability. They need to get the receivers a little bit more healthy, so they have more weapons on the outside for Josh Dobbs, but they just need to keep to who they are. The thing is that they can do extremely well. they got a running quarterback that can exploit you. They have athletic receivers on the outside. They need Pig Howard to get healthy. He's an explosive weapon from the slot. But defensively, they have to dictate the situation. Right now, they're playing to the situation, and they're playing passive on third and longs. When it's third and fourth and long, blitz. Go after the quarterback and try to dictate and make sure it comes out of his hand quick. Yeah, you definitely want to dictate on both sides of the football. Dobbs has got to throw the football better, obviously. But they did rush for 254 yards across the board against a really, really good Florida football defense. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think about the team. The defense of Florida is as real as there is in the country, and they went for 254. So that's something positive that they can meet about and really, and really grow on and, and build on. How much blame falls on Butch Jones here? I, I don't. I don't think any blame does. I. I, I think they, the team just got beat. I, I believe Florida's a better football team than what everybody else thinks. Now there are some situations that that Greg's talked about that that could have been handled differently, but in the heat of the moment, that gets lost sometimes. Florida is is really a better football team and took it to Tennessee late in that football game. Butch Jones deserves an awful lot of blame. Just being honest, Butch Jones should have gone for two. You want to know why? Because they just scored to go up by 12 points after a 16-play drive. 14 of those 16 plays were run plays. You look at Florida defenders, their hands are on their hips. You go for two in that situation. I don't care what the chart says. What it says is to read the game, and that's the head coach's job. And he did a poor job recognizing the situation and the fact that he had all the momentum on his side. All right, well, as Clint said, a lot of credit does go to Florida and what they were able to do well, especially on fourth down. Why don't you guys go over there, break it down for us, and tell us what went right for Florida in this one. Well, look, we're going to blame Tennessee and their miscues and their mistakes, but Florida does deserve an awful lot of credit, especially for some of the creative play calling they got, got into when it was a must-have situation. Yeah, Greg, this, this is the first time in a long time that Florida's had an offensive coordinator, or the head coach in this case, that really knows how to scheme up a defense and, get, and put these players in position to win before the ball is ever snapped. No doubt. You can see it right here, actually. They're in a fourth and six situation. You're about to see Brandon Powell motion across the formation, and he's going to run what we call an angle route. So he's going to be out and then back in, and he's going to force the Tennessee defenders 
into a box it situation. You can see the communication going on right here. Box it, box it, box it. That means he's responsible underneath, he's responsible wide, and they're responsible deep, allowing for a perfect throw on the angle. Yeah, and, and what's crucial here is, is spacing, patience, and timing. And these are young receivers and a very young quarterback that obviously have worked this a, a, a time and time again at practice. So a patient angle route that Greg talked about, that, that void in that defense, number one, McIlwain knew it was going to be there. Greer had made that throw several times. Number four right there getting amped up knew that was going to be a big play. Yeah, you oftentimes you see guys rush it so they don't necessarily sell the route to the flat. They'll chop their feet a little quick. It's all about isolations and matchups. Yeah. Right here, they're getting an isolation with this individual right here, excuse me, with this individual right here on the worst coverage defender on the field, the linebacker. You're going to see a little jerk route. Wide open on fourth and eight, another gotta-have-it situation, Clint. Well, this is a situation, too, Greg, where I think is unique. The last play as well. This right here, remember, he came in as a running back, correct? Yes. We're playing to his strengths as well. Body control, change of direction. He outplayed this, this linebacker right here. Again, giving the quarterback all kind of space to make that throw, and the run after the catch is great as well. The linebacker was on the ground in case you <laughs> missed it. He was falling. When you're playing man-to-man -man coverage as a quarterback, you want to identify safeties, and running backs against linebackers, worst defenders on the entire field when it comes to covering the pass. And then we go to the final play, which, as you know, a lot has been made about this 4th and 14 conversion. I had a real issue with what was going on with the defensive play call. What I don't understand, Will Greer is a right-handed passer. Explain to me this. Why would you pick this individual up and drop him into a spy technique to alert for the quarterback draw? He's on the quarterback's backside. If anything, that's where you want to rush from because the quarterback is not aware of what's going on behind him. And not to mention, Greg, it's, I believe, fourth and 13 or 14. Fourth and 14, yeah. Why exactly are you spying for a quarterback, for quarterback draw? draw? Yeah. <laughs> and, and against Will Greer, I, and believe me, if it's Dak Prescott or Josh Dobbs even, sure. I can kind of understand. But really, with Will Greer, a decent athlete, not a guy that's going to go get 15 and I got to have it situation. Right, right. Well, they're in another uh, three by one formation. This is not a bunch, but it's a very similar uh, setup to the last two fourth down plays. Obviously, they knew what Tennessee was going to do to that three, three receiver bunch type formation. But look at what Jim McElwain does. He does an incredible job of pushing the receivers past the sticks. This is poor job right here by this corner, not understanding where he's at on the field. He's actually playing in front of the line and not seeing anything behind him, knowing that nothing up here, he's looking this direction. Nothing up here is going to get the first down. You have to be aware of what's going on behind you. He loses track of it. You see the first window, great play, and then I love this, coming back on it, making a play, and bursting Callaway down the sideline for the touchdown. Uh, how about the ice in the veins of Will Greer? Yeah. And number four, that's un and every one of those plays, whether he's catching the ball or blocking, he made an impact to win this football game for Florida. Hey, critical situations. Tennessee now, two out of the last three games, has really made mistakes, but you have to give credit where credit is due. To Will Greer, the, the Gator offense, <laughs> and Jim McElwain. All right, what about Tennessee, Greg? Are you buying or selling their stock? I'm buying. I think they're still on the upward slope. This team has lost a couple close games, but they controlled their fate in both of those games. They just have to learn how to win. And sometimes when you have a young team going to that environment and going to Florida, it's a little bit difficult. And maybe they just got caught up in the moment. And then you look at the Oklahoma game, they didn't really, I don't think that they really expected to be so dominant through the yeah. first three quarters. So I'm still buying Tennessee. They still have an awful lot of talent. I'm buying as well. The, the NFL potential talent that's on this roster is still there that everybody knew was there before the season started. They're dealing with some injuries. They rushed for 254 last week against a great Florida defense. There's a lot to be said about that. And when you play some pretty good defense, although, although last week was a little bit suspect from time to time in the fourth quarter, play some pretty good defense, got some pretty good players, you can run the football, I'm buying Tennessee. And what a coincidence. Both of these teams need a win in the SEC. They're playing Arkansas. Are you buying the Razorbacks or selling them? I'm buying the Razorbacks. Stock trending up because I know that they're one and three. And look, their first four games left an awful lot to be desired, especially games against Toledo and Texas Tech. But at least against Texas Tech, they got back to who they are offensively, running the ball 40 plus times, controlling the line of scrimmage, and trying to play more sound defensively. This team is on on its way up, and they're going to knock off a good team later this year, I would assume. Yeah, I'm buying Arkansas. I, I agree to the point that later in the season, 
these teams are not going to want to play Arkansas or Tennessee at this point. So I, I'm buying them. There's some guys that will get back healthy for Arkansas and, and become a factor. Um, the defense, they, they, switched, they, they switched gears last week. They played a lot more man. They're a lot more aggressive. I like Arkansas's chances with that kind of defense. And like you said, getting back to their identity, running the football, I like that as well. So I'm buying Arkansas. All right, we went through both of them in the stock market. you got to do a quick pick. Who are you taking in the matchup between Arkansas and Tennessee? Ooh, that's a tough one. I think I'll probably go Arkansas. Lean Arkansas right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's granted. That's could very Subject easily to change. change. By yeah. the time you get to Nation. Ooh, <laughs> Nation by the time you get to Saturday. At 45 <laughs> Eastern. Yeah, you might want to tune plug, in and see plug, if I've changed. Plug. I personally appreciate your support for Arkansas for the last few months. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to go with Tennessee. I've played in, in Knoxville. I know it's very, very difficult. I think Arkansas has, has yet to really go on the road and, and be challenged in this type of environment. So we really don't know what's going to happen to them. Uh, I, I like Tennessee at home with all this talent and them learning from last week against Florida. Well, you both kind of look like stockbrokers, so I believe in you. I would buy in you, too. I'd give you some of my mutual <laughs> I don't know if I appreciate that. Like, yeah, I don't absolutely. know if stock I appreciate trending up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. Their stock market's about to crash, but they might have some good decisions when it comes to the game. Fanville, Razorbacks are 1-3, and three, and it's driving some Arkansas fans crazy. I don't want to go to the football game. I all right, so Tennessee, a trendy preseason pick to win the SEC East, while Arkansas was picked to finish ahead of Ole Miss and Texas A&M in the West, but neither team off to the start they'd hoped for. And both are coming off heartbreaking collapses in their SEC openers last week. The loser Saturday will be starting at an 0-2 start in conference play. So plenty to talk about here, but why they play the game this season, and as you can see, the predicted division finish for both of these teams, fourth for Arkansas and second for uh, Tennessee. That was according to the preseason poll from the SEC media. And certainly disappointing for these two teams uh, so far. But, hey, they only have one SEC mm -hmm. loss. I think that's what gets lost in the shovel here. Everybody's talking about how terrible things are for Arkansas and Tennessee. But, like I said, whoever loses this game now yeah. has two. So, Booger, who needs to win it more? Oh, it's definitely Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee's got to – they have to have this game. If, if you look at where Tennessee's at as a program, yes, they're young, but the games that they've been in, they should have won. They've blown two leads late in the fourth quarter. And when you have a young football team that's winning games by double-digit points, you have to finish those games off, and you have to have the psyche to give this team some confidence. So they need to get this win. I understand it's at home, but they have to win this game for their confidence, for their psyche, and they've blown two leads already. They need this as a bounce back. Well, I agree with you in some respect. Tennessee's big year was supposed to be 2016, mm -hmm. though. All right, everybody jumped that up a little bit because they had some success at the, in the last year. But this is all about Arkansas, in my opinion. They turned the corner last year, supposedly, at the end of the year, and then all of a sudden they have a huge opening game win. They're putting up all kind of passing numbers, and then the, the bottom falls out. Mm -hmm. Three straight losses. Right now this is headed in the wrong direction, back to what they were doing prior to the end of the season yeah. last year. They've got to turn the tide and get back to playing physical. I know you're in agreement with me there. Yes. They've got to find that identity. Mm -hmm the physicality, and I think this is the game that they have to do that to kind of get things turned back in the right direction. Booger, you mentioned Tennessee. We've seen the late game collapses. What is the biggest issue there for them? Well, it's coaching, and I know people want to blame the players, but it's all about the coaching and Butch Jones. He's got to be able to have an aggressive style to finish, finish games. Go back and look at the Oklahoma game. They barely threw the ball in the second half against Florida. Barely threw the ball. We can all discuss the going for two and whether or not you blitz on the fourth down, but it all comes down to coaching. Butch Jones has to coach his football team more aggressively, has to coach his team better down the stretch, and his kids will feed off of him if he does that. If he coaches passive, then his kids are going to be passive. He has to coach his team better down the stretch. Well, for Arkansas, it's the pass defense. They are dead last against the pass. Mm -hmm. They give up 264 yards a game through the air, and it seems like they give up the biggest plays at the most crucial yes. time. Yes. They've got to find yes. a way to solidify that mm -hmm. secondary, get some more pass rush, create a little bit of uh, momentum them there because right now they are very vulnerable in the and, second And that's the thing about the Arkansas defense last year. They didn't give up the big plays. They yeah. were a bend but don't break defense. The cover two under Rob Smith, they kept everything in front of them. This year it's just like, man, it's, it's just going over top of the <laughs> head just like that and they can't do that. Yeah, you know, this one is really interesting to me. I think it's one of the more interesting games just for so many different factors that we just talked about right there. Yeah, Daria, as usual, when they have a big game and a team loses, it's both the players' fault 
and the coaches. Butch Jones got a lot of blame, but the players also have some blame. We want to show you a couple of plays where the coaches made some good call and the players didn't necessarily execute those, Chris. That's very difficult to blame the coach here as you got a good play call, play design against what Florida's going to do here with a four wide receiver set where they motion the back out of the backfield. And here's the first thing I want to notice. Forget all the window dressing. Focus on two guys, linebacker and Brandon Powell. Forget everything else. This is about those two guys. These two guys are the two guys we have to concentrate on. And Florida runs a nice little play here. Motion to trips. Brandon Powell is going to come across the formation. As we freeze it here, Chris, they're focusing on stopping Brandon Powell from crossing the formation. The one thing he cannot do is let him across the mm -hmm. field. But Brandon Powell does a nice job of selling the return route and what we call a jerk route here. The middle linebacker has one job, mm. keep him from crossing the field. He's unable to complete it, and certainly a uh, nice pass and reception by Brandon Powell there for the first down. Yeah, Will Greer, five for five on fourth down and a touchdown. Great execution. Tennessee just a little bit off, which caused them, Florida, to be able to get that. Here's the play of the game, though. The first thing I want everybody to notice we have here, it is fourth down, Chris, and the line of gain is 14 yards away. Tennessee comes out, and they're going to play what we call a prevent defense. As we, as we roll the play here, notice – Right now, Chris, how many guys are rushing? Yeah, they're rushing three guys right now and dropping this guy back into coverage. It allows Will Greer to have time to comfortably stand in the pocket and let his receivers uncover against the zone. Yeah, and he, as, as we play it, receivers uncover. But here's the concept we have to look at. It is a four-on-three concept, meaning you have four defenders. When you have one, two, three, four guys here who's, who's rotated, but they're – they're maintaining their leverage. They are concentrating on three Florida Gators receivers as they go into the zone here. Now you see Brandon Powell take two of those receivers by clearing out the zone. Antonio Callaway has the dig route. He's able to sit down in this hole and find a spot where Will Greer can find him in, the, in that zone defense. And then another thing I want people to notice, notice the effort, number 13. He tries to change speeds here and turn it on, but it's too late because the play is already gone for a touchdown. The Tennessee Volunteers made some mistakes. Good calls by Butch Jones and the staff, but the players didn't necessarily execute, and the team they're going against this week, the Arkansas Razorbacks, they're in the same situation. They faced a Texas A&M team. They had a lead, but because they made some mistakes, the game went in overtime. Very similar mistakes we're going to show them here. Here's the first formation here. The first thing I noticed, Chris, this guy right here. Who is that? That would be Christian Kirk. Is he a fullback? He's not a fullback. <laughs> well-designed play, well-designed formation there, creating mismatches mm -hmm. and hiding him in a place where the Arkansas defense typically wouldn't look for him. They are man-to-man -man situations, which means these two guys here, these two got these two right here. Christian Kirk is a fullback, which means he's going to be covered by a linebacker. Great play call, bad execution by the University of Arkansas right here. As the play is going, going we see Christian Kirk slide through. And right now we know that nobody... Nobody is covering him right now. These linebackers are lost, Chris. Linebackers on Christian Kirk is a mismatch? Well, Christian Kirk against the air? <laughs> I'll take Christian Kirk all day long. Not only did they find him, but he's able to make yards after the catch and set up an Arkansas touchdown, or excuse me, a Texas A&M touchdown. Well, you just look at bad tackling by Arkansas. You got to be able to get the guy on the ground. It's one thing to be able to give up a long play, but you have to make the tackle here. And here's another formation. Very similar, Chris, man-to-man -man defense. You got guys man-to-man -man on the outside, but notice protection is pretty good, but as the play rolls, there's one guy. When you're a man-to-man, -man, as a man-to-man as -man defender, what's the number one thing you cannot do as a man-to-man -man defender? You cannot look for the ball early <laughs> and give up the deep play, both of which Arkansas does right here. Yeah. When you're a man-to-man, -man, close the coverage here. This is Josh Reynolds. This defender's a man-to-man. -man. Stop right here. Why are we looking why are we looking back? Your man is this way. Look at your man. Great call by Arkansas. Just bad execution by the players here. Yeah, you're in position. you got to finish the play. Coaches talk about finishing all the time, and that's something that both Tennessee and Arkansas struggled to do last Saturday. So Tennessee and Arkansas, either one can make these mistakes. Either one can also correct them. Both of them have to come out. If you, as you look at this game, what's going to be the key matchup as you see it? Well, both of these teams like to run the football very heavy with the run, but I think it comes down to the passing game. In all honesty, you're talking about the two worst pass defenses in the Southeastern Conference. Which of these opposing receivers can step up? You have Tennessee's receivers that have all been hidden for some reason right. throughout the year. Marquez North and uh, Pig Howard, those guys got to play and, and get the opportunity to make some plays down the field. And then Arkansas's receivers depleted because of injury. That's going to be the difference, in my opinion. One thing I think we can see, both teams can win this game. Whichever team doesn't make the mistakes, I think gives themselves a great chance to win this football game. How about Arkansas and Tennessee? These two 
need a conference win in a big way. Arkansas, of course, has lost three in a row. They are banged up. Three key wide receivers are out. Tennessee, how do they bounce back from the heartbreaking loss at Florida as they try to get, uh, of course, their first conference win of the season in Knoxville? Mr. Doring, you're up first. Take the pick. Going with Tennessee, 34-27. Again, this is a situation where teams are kind of in two different, two similar situations, both miserable mm -hmm. in the secondary. I think you talk about Arkansas having a couple guys out in the wide receiver position. It's going to come down to Tennessee making some plays, getting some of those guys involved in the passing game. Juwan uh, Jennings is, is a guy that can make some plays down the field. Where's Pig Howard? Where's Marquez North? Those guys got to make some plays against a very poor secondary for Arkansas. 31-24 Tennessee. And this has everything to do with this Arkansas defense. They've been giving up big plays week in and week out. I think the Tennessee Vols offense is very talented. We saw what Dobbs did last week. I think they'll get the wide receivers involved. And once again, Arkansas is void of enough offensive playmakers. They've got a lot of injuries. I think Tennessee exploits an Arkansas defense that gives up a lot of big plays. They make some. Tennessee gets to win. The question I kept getting asked when I was in Knoxville on Monday talking with some fans, mm -hmm. do our coaches know that we have wide receivers? Because they, they were dead serious. Exactly. Because they ha you ha we haven't seen them produce. In oh. Knoxville, where Tennessee will take on Arkansas in game some are calling the Desperation Bowl. Heavy rains since Thursday. Weather also expected to impact this game on ESPN2, 7 o'clock Eastern Time. And boy, both of these teams coming off heartbreak, the turnover by the Hogs that allowed the Aggies to find Christian Kirk down the field, get the game into overtime, and then save it with a defensive play as A&M stayed unbeaten. And then Tennessee giving up five fourth down conversions and then missing a 55-yard field goal and losing a 13-point fourth quarter lead and losing again in the waning moments. Tennessee's been terrific for about three and a half quarters. They can't find a way to finish the deal. Both coaches reaching into every motivational ploy that they can find, yeah. try to rally their teams for this game, which is huge for the rest of their season. I mean, I, I look at this game, Arkansas versus Tennessee. I'm like, you know, it's such an unsexy matchup right now. You have Arkansas losing three games in a row. Tennessee, a team that a lot of people had high hopes on coming into the season, losing huge marquee matchups against Oklahoma and then against Florida. Not only did they lose the games, but the way they lost the game. So these two teams are underachieved in the first month of college football already. I think Tennessee will win because Josh Dobbs will probably make a few more plays. Yeah. But I mean, this is like a sleeper. I mean, it's like a, I don't know, it's just not a great matchup to me to, to be talking about on TV because they don't about, deserve it. I agree, and, and a lot of times you, you want to sprint fast, you want to come out the gates really good. My recommendation is whoever's up in the third quarter, you're going to lose. So just my, get behind. Make sure you're not ahead coming in the fourth quarter. Tennessee, two out of the Oklahoma game, double-digit lead blown. Last game against Florida, double-digit double digit lead blown. Arkansas, you know Bielema was 0-10 in games decided by 10 points or less? I mean, that's... That's pretty bad. Close games, you got to make plays. Both these teams find a way for something to go wrong. They need something to go right. But I, I'm, I'm with Dez. Joshua Dobbs, to me, is a little bit more dependable, so I, I'll go with Tennessee. More dependable, but he's coming off a game where he threw 83 yards against yeah. Florida. He's only averaging 138 yards. Where has the passing game gone? I mean, they, they have a great group of wide receivers. To me, it's about becoming more balanced and not just about the running and the creating of Josh Dobbs and Jalen Hurd, but they've got to be able to stretch a defense. And the other thing is, coach fearlessly. I mean, on fourth and two in the first quarter, you take a halfback jump pass and go for it at the swamp, and it works, that mentality needs to be for four quarters. All of a sudden, they have the lead, and they're, they're coaching not to lose. They're playing to not to lose. That's very different from playing and, yeah. and going after it. This team should be sitting at 4-0, and if they're listening to local talk radio, they have plenty of motivation to get ready to play this game. But to me, I'm going with Tennessee because it's at home, but I think Josh Dobbs needs to stretch out the defense and start airing it out downfield. That's not his call. Right, but, exactly. But, but it's, they need to show that they can throw the football. That kick can throw the ball. Yeah, both of those guys, both 
coaches have been under a lot of fire. Heard about Butch Jones. Brett Bielema stayed up until the wee hours Sunday morning. Ended up putting together a presentation of failures turned success stories uh, like Jay-Z, for instance, and presented it to the team to let them know they can come back. I remember, I remember, last, see that one. remember <laughs> last year, they, 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 the, their last six or seven games, they were as hot Fire, as anybody. No right, exactly. So yeah. he's probably using that maybe as well. As recent as last year, we, we started slow and, and got it going. I, I'm actually excited to watch that game, but yeah, I, got, yeah. I got problems. Yeah. <laughs> Tennessee not expected <laughs> to have picked Howard in that game. Greg, Arkansas and Tennessee have a lot to deal with, with what's been happening in recent yeah. weeks. Now they've got the rain to deal with what about that game it gives Arkansas to me a huge advantage because of the downhill style rushing attack right now when you look at Tennessee a lot of their offense and their run game particularly is with the zone read so potential pulls the ball's going to be slick there's always three positions that pay close attention to the weather quarterbacks kickers and punters Josh Dobbs and Brandon Allen will be paying close attention but the running backs love this stuff but I'm also really nervous if I'm Arkansas because Tennessee knows that we have to go downhill yeah. and that is something that they're going to put eight nine men in the box and it is going to be an absolute battle and someone's going to get hit right in the face <laughs> specifically with the quarterback play overall when you deal with these conditions what are you thinking about I loved it this was my favorite type of weather because this is what you're meant to play football in. I mean, when I was a boy, this, we're going outside to play Tacoloco right now. And that's what I love. <laughs> so, you know what? I want to see which quarterback is going to step up with heart and say, I'm going to lead my team. I always felt like it was an advantage when it was raining because you're going to have a quarter. You know where you're going as a quarterback. You know where you're throwing it. You know where you're going to run. And the defense doesn't. So I always felt like they were off balance because the footing wasn't as good for them. So I feel like it is an advantage if you know what you're doing as a quarterback. And Paul, the StubHub crowd that paid 20 2300 for the lower <laughs> level now. Yeah, no, you don't want you don't want to be a guy who, who who bought your wife an anniversary present two weeks ago for this game because you can be outside the stadium today and probably get in a little bit cheaper. I'm a coach's guy, you know that, and I'm interested in Butch Jones versus Brett Bielema. It's a kind of loser leave town mentality. Both these coaches have struggled, and the loser of this one is in dire straits. Tennessee and Arkansas looking for their first conference win. Seven Eastern is going to be on ESPN two with Mark Jones, Rod Gilmore, and Quint Kess Nick, who caught up with Butch Jones. Coach, you said we can't let two plays and 10 seconds define who we are. Well, what has defined who you are this week? Well, just our overall ability to persevere, the way we've come to work, the way we've approached practice, our work capacity, and our team togetherness. And this is a hungry team, a very young football team. They know no different. And our older players have provided some stability with leadership as well. Arkansas plays at a very slow pace. What becomes most challenging about their tempo? Well, the maturity, the maturity of our football team. We've never been in a game like this. So we have to make every possession count. We can't turn the football over and we can't have any penalties. And we just have to be patient and make our possessions count. Thanks, Coach. You know, Rod Gilmore told me last night, he was talking to Butch Jones, and Butch said, hey, a lot of coaches reached out to him this week with those critical 10 seconds and said, listen, I wouldn't have gone for two either to make that score a 14-point margin against Florida. It's been a big debate all week long. Arkansas spent all offseason knowing they're playing arguably the toughest schedule in college football. They're 1-3 and three on that schedule already. Tennessee was the trendy pick. Heartbreak loss again, 2-2. Two and two. So now how critical is this game? Oh, it's so critical because both these teams were supposed to make that jump. And when you don't, when you lose heartbreaking games like both these teams did last week, what happens? You start to lose hope. You start to question how everything is done in your program. And you, you're, you don't buy in as much. And that is what these coaches have to get their players to do, is not to lose hope. Continue to buy in, believe in the system, believe in the program. Because if done right, they have to convince their players that it will pay off and they will be able to get those wins. I think the most difficult thing between both of these teams, for me as I see it, is Tennessee had the ability to win both of those games. And that's probably the hardest, yeah, yeah. That's the hardest part for me for you to try to get guys back because you're looking at your hands after, at the end of the game and you've won statistically, you've gained more yards, you've made a few more plays, and you still end up with a loss in, in the category. To me, that's the difficult one. Getting these young players, as Bush talks about all the time, like you said, Tim, to feel like, are we really doing everything to get us a W in these type of games when they're in the end? Given the state of the East right now, I don't think Tennessee is in jeopardy of missing a bowl game. But Arkansas, if they don't win this game, 
I think it's going to be mighty difficult to try to get to six wins at the end of the regular season. Well, they're going to be sitting at four losses, losses after today already. Yeah, it's going to be really hard given who they still have to play. LSU, Alabama, Ole Miss, A&M. There's a lot of tough games. Or, I'm sorry, they just lost to A&M. But there's a lot of tough games remaining on the schedule for Arkansas that could be huge hurdles if they're trying to go bowling again. And Joe, you said something a minute ago about Rod Gilmore saying that Butch Jones told him that he's heard from a lot of friends who said you made the right call. You better believe it. Those friends want him to continue making bad calls like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, size up Tennessee for me, though, Paul. And like the state of Tennessee right now with this. I, I, I think it's, it's very fragile. Uh, this is a program that was built on hype. Uh, Butch Jones is a great salesman. He's yet to prove he's a great head coach in the SEC. And if this game goes the wrong way, I think those fans with Georgia coming in next week, they're, they're going to start heading for the Smoky Mountains. Well, well, I mean, let's think about how much hype Oklahoma is getting right now. Oklahoma is moving up the rankings. They're getting a light, lot of hype, and everybody's talking about how good Oklahoma is. Tennessee outplayed Oklahoma. For three for, quarters. For three and a yeah. half quarters. Yeah. Until they took their foot off the gas and said, hey, we're just a little bit too scared of ourselves and exactly. too scared, and we're going to hope that we can find a way to win instead of believing, putting their foot on the gas, and winning at the end. They were scared, and that's why Oklahoma won. But this is a Tennessee team that should be 4-0, has a lot of talent, and they need to make that hurdle. But they need the leadership in the fourth quarter to say, we're not going to hope to win. We are going to win Jim, because we're going to get it done. They need better coaching. They need a coach who's not afraid to win. And right now, I haven't seen that from Butch Jones. All right, so let's talk about what what decides this game tonight? Arkansas at Tennessee. Pig Howard, wide receiver, is out. Tennessee wide receiver Marquez North is going to be a game time decision. Well, what's going to decide this game is can Arkansas go downhill and win versus a Tennessee defense that is going to stack the box and it is going to be a man's game. Yeah, I think that same thing, Tim. But for me, it's Tennessee and Josh Dobbs being the X factor in this game. Arkansas has been hurt tremendously in the secondary and they need to find a way to keep exploiting that because when you look at what Tennessee has done offensively they've been balanced they've used every single guy that they feel like can be home run hitters and produce offensively Josh Dobbs with his legs Jalen Hurd Kamara they've made plays on offense with being a multiple look team they need to continue that trait because that's where Arkansas, Arkansas struggles to me when you're a team that can hurt them a lot of ways. Arkansas is getting back to who they are. Over the last couple games, 85 carries for their running backs. The first two games, they only had 65. So they're getting back to who they are. But you would imagine, given the weather, given the identity Arkansas has offensively, it's going to be a low-scoring game, a real tough physical battle. In one-score games, Brett Bielema, since he took over in Fayetteville, is 0-9. Can mm. Arkansas figure out ways to make the key plays at the end of the game that could shift it in their favor? Jalen raves Mabin and the other linebackers of Tennessee are going to need to play really, really well today and tackle Arkansas in that run game. Good Arkansas, one. Tennessee, 7 o'clock, ESPN2, Mark Jones, Rod Gilmore, Quint Kesnick on the call. 97% at one point they were going to beat Oklahoma in terms of maximum win probability. 93% at one point they were set to beat Florida. They lost. What happens here? Well, Joshua Dobbs, he wears a back brace today, and he puts the team on his shoulders, and he gets it done in the fourth quarter. Tennessee wins. Tennessee. Tennessee has looked like the better team in every game I've watched them play. They finally close out and win this game today. Not me. I'm Ooh. going with the Woo Pig Suey <laughs> Razorbacks. In the conditions, the downhill, A-gap to A-gap running style, and the more experienced passer, Brandon point. Allen, makes the right decisions, and a big win for them, a must-needed win, in Neyland Stadium. Tennessee's ahead in the fourth quarter. Lock Butch Jones in the dressing room. <laughs> Tennessee will win this game. Albeit in that loss at the Swamp in Florida. A pivotal and critical night underway for both these teams. On the return, the Volunteers get a good one from Evan Berry. Off and running! This is how you do it! In Knoxville, touchdown ball, 96 yards! First down and 10 from the 23. Heard.
Couldn't get to the edge. Well defended that time by game. Arkansas. Interesting game for about two and a half quarters. Here in Knoxville, Tennessee, it's a great start for the Volunteers. They lead 14-0. Brandon Allen completing that pass, though, to Drew Morgan, who's still alive and on the move. Morgan all the way down to the 22-yard line. They have him in the slot there, bring him across the middle of the field. We've seen it a thousand times. And then you have poor angles, poor pursuit on the back end there. A tough time trying to corral him. That was Randolph who missed him. And Collins... Great move between the tackles. Three tight ends. Collins, touchdown untouched. The fifth year senior Brandon Allen with a poised looking drive right there. The team believes it was the right thing. And that's all that counts for him. Third and six. Dobbs fires complete but short of the first down to Jennings. Good tackle by Dean. And Got to be somewhere north of 75%. Tamara in the ball game. It's his turn. For a good open field tackle there around that front. And smash mouth football. This is Raleigh Williams, the true freshman, with an illustration. The double deuce on the loose. Clear eyes, full heart. He had clear eyes right there, slipping that one guy in the backfield. Good effort from the left mm -hmm. side of his line. And they really like this kid. They think he's going, oh my goodness. <laughs> when he comes over to eat, you lock up the refrigerator, man. But a catch and a run. Reed, touchdown, Razorbacks. And they score. And Reed just comes across the middle as we've seen so many routes by Arkansas. And then poor angles once again by Tennessee as we saw earlier. Could not lay a hand on Reed. And just like that, Jonesy. Heard approaching the 100-yard mark with 92. He's going to lose a couple here. Dobbs complete. Williams fumbles it. And Arkansas recovers the ball. <laughs> Tevin Beanham pounced on the loose pill. And Preston Williams turns the ball over. That is another red zone coming up empty mm. for Tennessee. And that's just a fumble. That just came out. First and 10 from back of the 23. Going to hand it off to Hurd into the boundary. And stuck after a gain of about two. Yeah, and you turned on it. Second and nine. Third again. And stuck. And that was Mo Better. Third and 15. The handoff to Collins. It's going to get the first down and then some. Looking at the sidelines to get out of bounds. Arkansas winning the Texas Bowl. Allen fires complete to his tall, rangy receiver, Kendrick Edwards. Just got it inside that right upright. First down and 10, little bunch formation to the right. And starting quarterback, Brandon Allen. They run the bootleg and complete it for the first down out near the 35-yard line. Play action. Allen finds his man at the eight. And once again, Drew Morgan gives it a first and goal now for Arkansas. Collins again. Touchdown, Hogs. A lot of the flat screen TVs and a lot of the eating establishments. Dobbs juggled the snap, and then Hurd is going to lose a couple of yards. Good penetration by Tevin Beanham. The receiver's out to the top of the screen. Here's the fly sweep. That's the freshman, Camara, brought down by Ramirez. I think you're right. They've thrown a lot of screens, but they can use his feet and let him get going. Got to be clutch on third down. This one batted down at the line of scrimmage by Jeremiah Ledbetter. We've said his name frequently tonight. One of the inductees and uh, the volunteers trailing by four after that field goal a moment ago. 
They get the playoff. Allen under duress escapes. Caught! Hunter Henry! Wow! First down, Hogs! I mean, watch the soft hands at the end of this. Now, great job by Allen finding some space, getting off platform, and getting the ball out there. But look at this catch. And that's a mm. tight end. That is why he is the number one rated tight end as a prospect for the NFL draft for hands like that. A 51-yard gain, Rod. They converted last time. Hunter in motion. They toss it into the boundary. Williams, first down and then some. First and goal for the Hogs, down at the seven. Famous author of yeah, J.P. Rutherford. Yeah, J.P. Rowan. There's Collins. Writing in a success story out to midfield. Let's see where it goes. Allen going to take off. Lunging and coming up right near that marker. Let's see where they spot it. Let's see where they put this. Oh, this is going to be short, according to that spot, by that much. But he understands they're in a desperate situation. They have to win this game. And Tennessee has had issues on fourth downs late this season. Defensively, Allen finally got a little movement up front and got enough for the first down. From the 40. Williams. A great yawning hole. First down at the 25. Has run it six consecutive times. Allen to pass. Complete. Near another first down. That's Drew Morgan. If you want to get your fans to second guess you with a chance to go up by a touchdown and you run a fake and you leave the other team in position to win, oh, you will hear it. Arkansas, Tennessee is alive. Steps up. The ball's loose, fumbled. No signal yet. Question is, was the arm coming forward? Nope, ball was out before the arm came forward. Clear fumble, but recovered by Tennessee. Arkansas missed out on an opportunity to be set up here for a scoring opportunity. Now they have to kick a lot of heat on Fitz Jones because of that. Heard met immediately. Trying to stay alive as we go back to Chris Cotter in the studio. Dobbs looking to throw it. He slips and is sacked back at the 43-yard line. Fourth from me. Got to bring four or five. Dobbs taking a shot up top. Man coverage incomplete. He tried to hit Malone. And a change of possession here. And the agony is tangible here for Tennessee fans. Collins has carried it 22 times tonight. Make it 23. Nice gain on first down. About five and, uh, well, that tells you about what they're thinking right now. How much belief they have in the outcome of this game and the certainty of it. Collins on the toss, got all kinds of real estate. The first down and then some, Alex Collins might have just put this game on ice. And on the schedule to make some big things happen, but unable to. Brandon Allen now gonna run out time and fall down. And that'll do it. Do the math on this one. And the Arkansas Razorbacks snap their three game losing streak and overcome their fourth quarter misery as Brandon Helen's mom there, Marcella, with a huge exhale. Austin, his younger brother, the backup quarterback, will probably join one. Conversely, for Butch Jones, well, there are two things. There's winning and there's misery. Don't have to tell you which one Butch Jones is experiencing now. Starring Chris Booger, Arkansas, and Tennessee. Teams trying to avoid 0-2 conference starts.
Of course, the story with Tennessee, fast starts, grab a lead, not hang on. In fact, they've scored double-digit first quarter points in three of their first four games. Opening kickoff. It doesn't get much better than this for the folks in Orange at Neyland Stadium. Evan Berry is gone. Seven zip balls. Another fast start, guys. Where is he going? To the house. That's right. He's starting faster than that? I don't think he no, can. You cannot? No. Then after an Arkansas punt, Jalen Hurd. Hurd around the corner. Hurd down the sideline for a big game. Same drive, third and six, Josh Dobbs. Notice what you don't see, though. You don't see Tennessee throwing the football. And that's going to come back to haunt them. Well, very shorthanded. Very shorthanded. Mm -hmm. you know. No Marquez North, uh, for instance. Pig Howard, for instance, gone. All right. Raleigh Williams. Uh, Jonathan Williams gone. Throw, let's throw another Williams in there. <laughs> Raleigh Williams with his team down 14-7. Look, I know you like seeing this, right? Arkansas running the football yes, effectively. Yes, Arkansas being Arkansas, right? Second and 15, Brandon Allen. And then B.A. dropping dimes. Dominique Reed tackling optional here in Knoxville. 14-14. Getting a finger on. He would have been down in two-hand touch. touch. <laughs> or one-hand touch. 17-17. Alex Collins then. This is Arkansas football. Uh -huh. Downhill, mm -hmm. put the hand in the guy's face and make them tackle a big back. So Collins knocked out of bounds, then play action. Allen, big completion. Drew Morgan, who's become a go-to guy. He's had to. He has, no doubt. Collins touchdown. So remember the 14-0 lead for Tennessee. It's gone. And now they trail, 24-17. Special teams, a problem. Cole Headland's kick blocked. Uh, by the Vols. Walked by the, somebody's back of their head. That was the lowest kick I've ever seen. Uh, exactly. So, now, look, Tennessee staying around here, 24-20, and then, oh, they tried to fake. It was tricky hogs. That's right. Your kicker can't kick. You might as well let him try to run it. Well, Adam McFain pushed out by Kenny Bynum. So the defense holds again. Now you wonder, are you Arkansas? They've suffered heartbreak just like Tennessee. Dobbs to Josh Smith. On third and 13, so a big conversion there. A little later, fourth and 13. Dobbs over the head of Josh Malone. Razorbacks run out the clock and win 24 to 20. Tennessee falls to two and three. 0 and two in conference play. And uh, I saw facts several times looking up Twitter. That's the eighth straight year. We can confirm that they are 0 and two in conference play. Meanwhile, Brett Bielema, first road win in conference play at Arkansas. Coach, coming off a three-game losing streak, what was your reaction to falling behind 14-0 early? You know, uh, our guys got great perseverance. We wouldn't have been through all this stuff we've been through if we didn't have that. So just want to take our guys uh, in the locker room and have talk about what we need to do to close this game out. Obviously, had a lot of guys execute and do well. Yeah, the game changed at halftime. What made the difference in the second half? You know, I think defensively, we just played a lot better. Um, kept the ball in front of us, didn't give up free yards. Uh, kicking game came through. We obviously didn't feel great about the hold while I went for that fake. We wanted to get here and get a win and killer mentality. And now we got a week to get together. We got Bama, uh, and then we got a bye week and see how many we can get here. How do you describe the importance of what we just saw? for Arkansas going on the road and getting a win. Oh, it was a great win. Brett Bielema got his third SEC win, his first on the road. Mm -hmm. But to get back to playing Arkansas football, yeah. two running backs, not one, two over 100 yards, B.A. with the play action pass. They played Arkansas football tonight. And more importantly, defensively, they didn't give up their big yeah. plays. Uh, I want to give them credit for their mental toughness. Yes. Too. This was a team that lost three games in a row after having the open kickoff returned against them and being <laughs> down 14 nothing. They very easily could have folded the 10 up, but they hung in there. They were committed to their game plan. 275 yards rushing. Yes. Most importantly, they didn't turn the football yes. over, and that was the difference in the ballgame, Dari.